praise the Lord. We're good. Yeah. Should we put Isaiah in here somewhere? Isaiah the prophet, him in there. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lord. I um, I know that looks pretty amateurish, but that's all right. I think it'll get the point across. These, uh, you know, if I was to draw this in scale, it'd be more like this lower drawing here that has 4,000 years, then 2,000 years since Christ. And then a little period of time was seven years at the end of this age of mercy and grace. And then I could extend it on out there for another thousand years, which is the millennium after the return of Christ. But you notice I've, I'm, I've drawn this in such a way where we have these breaks that I'm just blowing it up to where we're going to talk mostly about this seven year period uh, that's called the Great Temptation. The tribulation, or Jacob's trouble. So that's the time frame that we're uh, we're going to speak about again today. We we've spoke about it numerous times in the past from different views and perspectives, and I'm not sure exactly what directions it'll take today. But I want to explain these lines. So we had the beginning of the tribulation, a three and a half year period, the middle of the tribulation, and then a three and a half year period to the second coming of Christ. Right here. At the end of that seven year period. And then the 1,000 year millennial, or I don't know why it's redundant, but I'll put it anyway, millennial reign of Christ. So those, those, this is basically where we're going to get today. Praise the Lord. We're almost through Isaiah. <laughs> it's, it's amazing to me how fast time goes. And maybe it hadn't gone fast for y'all because you had to sit out there and listen, but Isaiah has flown by for me. And I think we've probably just did less than one and a half chapters a week, maybe. Yeah, probably less than that. But here we are on the, I think last week was the 61st chapter. I thought it was a really interesting, uh, uh, interesting lesson, although I can't draw much back to memory at the moment. I know it had to do with correlating the, the Spirit of God is upon me where that was uh, the 61st chapter, the first verse where Isaiah was quoted by Jesus Christ in that day in the synagogue. And we, we drew the parallels of the Spirit of the Lord is upon me that uh, Isaiah spoke about, and then the application that our Lord used on the day that he stood up in the synagogue, reading that verse and reading it to a certain point, closed the book of Isaiah in the mid-sentence, sat down, and said, this day in your ears, this, this scripture is fulfilled. And we took that application to from that day where the Lord said, you know, this day is fulfilled with meaning in your, your ears because he didn't continue in the verse where it says the day of the vengeance of the Lord. So, so we, we, we drew some parallels of what the Lord was saying out of the 61st chapter of Isaiah and reflected it and projected it on into the future that future day of the day of the Lord and the day of the vengeance of the Lord at his second coming. And we, we show, showed in that lesson where the spirit of the Lord is upon me is, is that the spirit is long upon me to accomplish his will. And he prepared for me a body. He prepared for him a body back here that, 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 and he had a purpose in the preparing of the body, which means the restoration of all things and the redemption of, of mankind and the vengeance of the Lord, 
was his purposes are going to be fulfilled in the second coming, wherein we could say, just as we did in that day, the Lord said, the spirit is upon me to the fullness of his purposes. The spirit is upon him in the second coming, which would include both the, the day of the Lord, uh, the vengeance of the Lord. And it also would continue on in establishing him and a people in the kingdom of, of Christ in that millennial period of time. So, to that end also is that day of the Lord, the day of Jubilee. So we, we tied together both the, <laughs> the day of the Lord, the day of the vengeance of the Lord, uh, with that one year annual uh, uh, event wherein the high priest went in before the Lord on the day of atonement behind the veil with an offering of blood and came out. And when he came out, then it was the trumpet sounded in the seventh, seventh, seventh year, 49th year to declare the next year is the, the day, a year of Jubilee, that that is also being fulfilled in the day of the Lord. So we spoke down those lines last week, and we're continuing in that same theme. We're, we're taking on some more uh, about that event, but the 62nd chapter of Isaiah is that not that distant in spirit or location from what it was the Lord was talking about in the 61st chapter. So we're going to have a continuation here in the message, although I don't believe it'll be much duplication of what was said last week because the subject matter changes in from the perspective of the Lord. So we can go down a different path. If I haven't lost you, we're, we're in the 62nd chapter of Isaiah, and, the, and I, I continued into the 63rd chapter, and I actually took um, the subject from the, uh, that I'm going to focus on from the 63rd chapter, the first four verses, to begin the lesson. And in the 63rd chapter, we'll, we'll come back to the 62nd chapter and try to apply some meaning in the second, 62nd chapter, as well as... 63rd chapter in our overall scheme of which has always been to lay Isaiah or the book of Revelation. We're not looking for the historical significance as it relates to the old covenant and the prophetic words of Isaiah as much as we are looking for their, the filling up with meaning in the final uh, mode uh, we know there was some significant fulfillings of the word along the way, the prophetic word. But we know the majority of Isaiah has yet unfulfilled scripture. And we know that most of Isaiah unfulfilled scripture is found in this period of time that we're focusing on the last seven years, that suspended seven year period of Daniel and through the thousand years of the millennial reign. This is where Isaiah focused and had in view all of these events in particular He's speaking about this one day event in quite, de uh, quite a lot of detail. So it is that in that way that we're picking up. We're not picking up all the significant prophetic meanings as applied to Babylon and then later to Rome and those arenas and how Edom is tied to this and that and all of those nuances that are certainly there. But we're skipping forward all the way here into the new covenant book of Revelation to find the final, complete fulfilling of the prophetic words of Isaiah. So with that in mind, we pick up in Isaiah 63, 1 through 4, where it says, Who is this that cometh from Edom? Which in some, some aspects is Rome and Babylon. From a Jewish perspective, certainly, but from a New Covenant perspective as well. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? This that is glorious this that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine vat? I have trodden the wine press alone, and of the people there was none with me. For I will tread... <laughs> This is me typing, so I, you know, I didn't take it and snapshot at some scripture and then put it over in and print it out. I type all of this out. So 
Sometimes if I don't proof it real good, you're going to find my, my typing errors there. And so I have trodden the wine press alone, and of the people there was none with me, for I will tread in the mine anger and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment, or the day of the vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. So in commenting on that few verses, there is a verse in rear view mirror, and that being, you know, we have the prophetic, which is in the forward view, but the rear view of this verse or these verses is found in Deuteronomy 31 and 32, but in particular 31, 29, and 30 of the Song of Moses. Keep that in mind. Remember that was in his last day that the Lord had, had got, given him a poem or a song they was to sing in the ears of, of all Israel, or at least in the leaders of Israel's ears. So here in Deuteronomy 31, 29, 30, we have that the leading up into that song, the song of Moses of chapter 32. So verses 32 and 33 and 40 and 42 of chapter 32, we have this sister scripture from Isaiah in rear view mirror. If I wet my glittering sword and mine hand take hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to mine enemies. And you'll remember in, in this day of Moses, his last day, his 120th year, he, he was laying bare the hearts of those Israelites in that day. And he was saying, you know, how bad are you when I'm here? How much worse you're going to be? And he was pointing to the end time. And in that, he, the word of the Lord was uh, to be a witness for it, to that generation and all the generations of Israel since. And so he is he's predicting uh, prophetically the end of, at the end of the age, what he would be doing as it relates to Israel and to the nations of the earth. If I wet my glittering sword and mine hand take hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to my enemies, to mine enemies, and will reward them that hate me. I will make mine arrows drunk with blood, and my sword shall devour flesh, and that with the blood of the slain of the captives, from the beginning of revenges, revenges upon the enemy. Rejoice, O you nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and will render vengeance to his adversaries, and I will be merciful unto this land and to his people. Now I put a little bit more than those first four verses up for you to meditate on, those first four verses in the 63rd chapter of Isaiah. In some respects, I carried there in Deuteronomy 32 a little further than just the vengeance and went into that which is led that we are led into in the remainder of the 63rd chapter where it also gives the exhortation with a word of comfort and promise. So I led you on into that as I finished up the wor words of, I, of uh, Moses in the 32nd chapter. And, but all together, we're well, not trying to confuse you, but all together, they both, both of those together, have in future the end time view, the Valley of Jehoshaphat or Megiddo. And some of you, maybe all of you have been there. It's also Armageddon, called Armageddon. So they're all synonymous, the same place, north, north and a little bit to the west of Jerusalem. And here we find that final word that these other two sets of verses in the historic past have in view, and that are into our future, Revelation 19, 11 through 13. And that is, and I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. In righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written, that no man knew but he himself, and he's clothed with a vesture, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So it is on those verses 
that we will focus in that we should, I believe anyone would that looked very deep would recognize easily that they are the, the scriptures that are reflective of Isaiah's heart and mind and gave him the impetus to, to bring forth this word. They are finally fulfilled there in Revelation chapter 19. So it is there that we'll focus, because that's where those words are to be placed. This last day event, and events directly leading up to it, that last day event that we're speaking of is the second coming. This is that, the leaving, and I would draw a horse right here with the Lord on it if I could, if I was Jim, and him leaving, and him leaving behind the veil, right? So we had, we have in type, oops, we have in type the holy place, and then holy of holies, right? And it's behind this veil into where the Ark of the Covenant is. Here's the brazen altar. Altar, here's the golden altar, here's the whole tabernacle. So we have the high priest, who is now at the right hand of the Father in the third heaven. We have him now in type, coming out from this place behind the veil, the holy of places, holy of holies. And we have him having first came and set up his throne and received his investiture that we find in Revelation chapter 4, verse 2. Then we have him leaving this arena and coming here to the actual earth on this horse, in this dress, in this garment, in this vesture that is described with all this blood on it. The same that is described there in Isaiah 63, 1 through 4. So it's that event, that's exactly the same event Moses was speaking around in Deuteronomy 31, 32, 33. So we're, we, we all should be on that page that we're, that we're correctly discerning the Word of God and applying the scripture to compare scripture to scripture. That's the only way you find harmony. It's the only way you find truth is comparing scripture to scripture. Coming up with your own wild ideas doesn't work too well, although many buy into it, especially if it's peace and comfort and safety. There's nothing about peace, comfort, and safety in this message, my friends. So if you not if you come to hear that, go ahead and leave because it's not going to be here. Or go ahead and turn me off on that YouTube or that inner tube or whatever. And uh, just know it's going to be all about Suffering, uh, death, pain, and uh, the vengeance of God. That's, that's what the lesson is. That's what Isaiah is talking about. So we're going to correctly apply it. We're going to do our very best with God's help to convey his heart in it. Because that's really the idea. God wants us to get a hold of this, not to scare us, although he'd love to have us have reverential fear for him, because that's, that's the first step in departing from evil. He'd love that to apply. That's the whole purpose of the old covenant, in case you wanted to scare you into seeking him. So that's... That's a part of his purposes, but also as a part of his encourage us and exhort us and, and make us aware of the seriousness of this life and the time and that, you know, flip that little sand thing over. I wish sometimes we had those things still because we could watch the, actually the sands fall through and we could see it's getting closer and closer and closer. And that's the idea here is the Lord to show us an inverted one of those sand time things and show how few little grains of sand are left in the top of that thing. And we're in there. That's our hearts in there. And once we slide through that hole into the eternity, it doesn't matter no more. You can't go back and repeat. So that's what I mean. Those things God has in mind today to speak to our hearts. And if you have patience and you calm yourself and not let the cares of this world bother you for the next hour and a half, I believe God will speak to you. I, I believe God will project you, propel you, shoot you into a into an arena that you haven't been before, that he will allow him to speak into your life. If you're all about thinking about the things you got to do and what time it is and what he's carrying on and what is it, you, you know, you're going to lose a lot of, you're just going to miss it. And it's going to be vain that you're even here anyway. So hopefully with God's help and grace, we can stay in the same, same spirit of mind, me to bring the word of the Lord, you to hear it. Yes. Time, th yeah, time, hourglass. Yeah, that's what, what I was looking for. Yeah, it seems to. It seems to. I mean, it really looks like it, that it's really falling out too, real quickly, you know. It, 
I wouldn't be surprised that it is. I mean, we've talked about it, right? Exponentially, how time seems to be just going, 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 going. Well, I mean, I wake up and it's Saturday. Every day, it's Groundhog Day. I just keep getting up. It's Saturday. It's Saturday again. I mean, it's so fast. It ain't just unbelievable. So I hear you. I saw. So I hear you, Curtis. The last day event, and that one I just pointed out, an event's directly associated with the manifest second coming of the Lord to the earth is further elaborated on in the book of Revelation, chapter 7, chapters 14, 17 through 20, and 15, chapter 15, and other verses in chapter 19. Now, that is what we're going to attempt to do. And never having done this, you know, this is my first shot. So I don't get no practice runs. It's always just boom, and that's it. And then I move on. So I hope that I can make this make sense that's in my heart, that's resonating in me, that I understand that it just comes so fast sometimes I can't get my arms around it and get it down and get my thoughts lined because it's, you know, I'm old for one thing. Two is just so full and just a little bit of the, the foolishness of God is so much wiser than anything I got that it seems like it's a pages of pages in one moment. It's not. It's just one of his little thoughts. But it, to me, seems vast, unsearchable. And I just try to get parts of it, connect a few dots. So yeah, I'm trying to focus on this last period of time, probably the last three and a half years on that drawing more than anything. And I'm trying to point us toward that day and that day that around that day. What's happening on this day? The day of the Lord, the second coming of the Lord. Not so much when, we just know it is, and it's soon. It, well, it's going to be soon no matter what. Too soon for some. So when it is, is not what we're focusing on so much is that we know it is, and what is it? And so th this, this second coming of the Lord to earth, to earth, to earth, to earth. Not, not to the heavens above the earth, but we're concentrating on this, his second coming at the moment. That's what we're talking about. And I'm saying that's what... Isaiah is talking about 63rd chapter, first four verse. That's what it was talking about in, uh, in Deuteronomy 20. That's what it's talking about in Revelation chapter 19, is that day, that moment. But there's a lot of things around that day and that moment that are brought out in Scripture and in Revelation, and not necessarily, and, not, and usually not in such an order chronologically that you can get your arms around it because it is an enigma, because it is what God does. He hides things and then he reveals to who that was he wants it revealed to, which is anybody with a heart to understand. So it is just it seems to those who read it as a word salad, but it's not. It's actually very succinct and very much in order. And in, and God, and once God gives you those the, the the way He does it, then it kind of starts to make sense. So we're looking at first these verses uh, that relate to this one moment in time which is the second coming of the Lord. All right, is that said anywhere then other than in Revelation 19? Yes, it's said in Revelation chapter 7. Okay, let's just turn to Revelation chapter 7. Keeping in mind, we're talking about an event in the overall, but we're looking at some of the surrounding things that are happening just before this event. Just before, meaning here in the seventh chapter, of Revelation, and I, I'm not chronologically doing anything, I'm not setting times and dates and all that stuff. I'm just adding order to our thinking. God is not opposed for us to have an understanding, right? It doesn't have to be enigma. It doesn't have to be puzzling. It doesn't have to be vague. It can be more succinct, even though we can't point out the day, the hour, the time, or exact moments that some of these things are going to happen. We can get a general idea because he's given us and revealed to us real clearly a general idea. And so these verses that we're going to read in chapter 7 actually have to do with some, some time frame in here somewhere, uh, the first uh, nine verses, that have to do with some time in the backload of the first three and a half years. It's sometime in that arena. It is after the fifth and the sixth seal's been broken. And so there's been some seals, judgments open. There's been some tribulation. But we're not talking in terms of the great temptation. The great temptation and Jacob's trouble more focuses on this last three and a half years than it does on this first three and a half years. This is tribulation, but this is the great tribulation. This is the great Jacob's trouble. So we're focusing on a time frame 
wherein the Lord is drawing some boundaries. And so when we go to Revelation chapter 7 and we begin to read in the first verse, we see, and after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, and that the wind should not blow on the earth. So it's something that has to do with the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel, maybe the Lord, ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. See, the seal has been broken but on this fifth seal, and it's been broken on the sixth seal. And now the, all of this very uh, intense uh, uh, tribulation on mankind is going to transpire just right before these trumpets are to be sounding. And the Lord said, wait a minute. Hold up, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And then it goes on and lists. I heard the number of them were sealed, and they were selected and sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. You know, I take the word of God literal, but it's not always literal. It's the, it's the way in the Middle East. It's the way the Eastern mind where they wrote both figuratively and in literal senses. So you have to have the wisdom and the heart, and the spirit of the Lord to try to help you to focus on what is literal and what isn't literal. And this is one of those subjects that I'm not sure whether it's literal or not literal as far as that 144,000. It's literal on the ceiling. It's the literal ceiling of, of the tribes of Israel, all 12 of them, right? across the whole earth, not just in Israel. Those are literal things that we can take out of this. Whether the number is exactly 144,000 or that 144,000 stands for the 12 times 12, it has to do with a mystical uh, number that God uses in, to uh, convey a certain sense of fulfilling. Uh, I don't know if that's the sense here, but let's just say it's 144,000. So he seals 12,000 from each tribe. Each tribe, what is that? Well, are we a tribe or are we the new man? We're not Jewish. We are the new man. We're not trying to be Jewish. We're, trying, we're not trying to be Gentiles either. We're trying to be the new man. And so this doesn't represent us. This 144,000 doesn't represent us. It represents the tribes of Israel that is being sealed before this exponential type of judgment comes on the earth wherein their lives will be threatened without the sealing. But with a ceiling, that guarantees them of something. And I would suggest that it guarantees them of living throughout the rest of the tribulation period. So out of these 12, 12 tribes, the Lord seals 12,000 from each tribe. In other words, these are elected God. These are fulfilling the promises of Abraham. These are, you do not deserve this, but I am. Now, don't they say they don't have merit, they don't have character, and he doesn't select the right, the ones that he has worked with in their lives who have yielded and humbled, and thus, not to say that, but yet they are, they're going to be there because God has already uh, said it. He's already put out the word, and he, they're going to be there, and they're going to be 144,000 of them sealed. So that is a part of, we're leading up to the day of the Lord, but, and that is really bad stuff, getting close to the day of the Lord. These back up now, and we're thinking in terms of the day of the Lord, but these are sealed sometime before worst of the worst, before Jacob's trouble. Really. So what are we saying? I'm saying, well, the 19th chapter of Revelation has something, our understanding of the 19th chapter and the second coming of the Lord on the horse with his vesture covered with blood. We understand there's some things that are going to happen before that, and this is one of the significant things that we go back in time and we say, oh, okay, he's sealed. Before that time, there's going to be those 144,000 on that day that he does come. And his vesture is covered in blood. It isn't going to be their blood. I think that's significant to, to understand, to start putting together the, the enigma that we find in the word of the book of Revelation. And then it goes on then from that part into the second part, starting there. I'd like to start in verse 9. After this, after this, after this, after this vision, after I saw this, then I saw something else. And it's not the same time. It isn't chronologically in order. It is something that we know is not in chronological order because, because of what the event is. This event, well, the first event that we just read in those first verses uh, was sometime in this time frame. The next verses we're getting to read are actually 
at this point, at this point right before the coming of the Lord. How do we know that? Well, the, the Word tells us, and we'll, we'll see that as we read it. After this, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude. See, we just had 144,000. But all of a sudden, we have a great multitude, which no man could number. That's a lot of people. And this wasn't of the tribes of Israel. This of all nations and kindreds and people. This we know then is the new man. And tongues stood before the throne and before the lamb. Where was it? It was before the throne. So before the throne, either, and, I, and I've always represented that, that I'm not dogmatic about this, but this is just what Mike Balloon thinks the scriptures say. It doesn't really matter, but Mike Balloon believes that the fourth chapter of Revelation, verse 2, is there is an investiture, and it's a lot like Ezekiel chapter 1 back here, where there was this, this, this setting up of a throne, which is a tribunal that the Lord uh, came to the earth, and he judged the earth, and he marked and sealed. Do you remember him marking and sealing and so forth? Well, that was off of a tribunal on a setup. And Ezekiel goes into an elaborate uh, description of this throne and the presence of God and all this stuff. And this is exactly what the same description that we have in Revelation chapter 4 and 5. And this is where I believe that the scriptures are teaching that the Lord will come from, and that therefore that with those the scriptures that we're reading now in the seventh chapter in the ninth and tenth verses where it is the multitude is standing. I'm sorry to be so wordy, but I'm trying to make this all make sense, okay? So this multitude is now either standing here or they're standing here, okay? Wh whatever, but because I believe it's here, let's just talk about it being here, but know that I'm not dogmatic about it. It could be here. It really doesn't matter. It just matters to me because I have my own... Uh, way of thinking about this. It doesn't change doctrinally, it, and so therefore it doesn't, shouldn't matter to you. But let's say from Mike Balloon's viewpoint, the Word of God suggests that this multitude is here before the throne of God. Before the throne of God, before the throne of God, before the throne of God. So this multitude is before the throne. The other were on the earth, sealed on the earth. These are not on the earth. These are in the heavens. These are a multitude. These are out of every tongue and nation. They aren't Israel. Israel's on the earth. They're sealed on earth. These aren't sealed. They're gathered up. They're out of there. They're not on there. So go on to read. Clothed, clothed with white robes. They've been declared righteous and palms in their hands and cried with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood around about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God. Okay. Saying, I'm just, I had a thought. I was going to take you into another, but I don't want to lose you. Saying, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto the God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, what are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, these are they which came out of the great tribulation. All right. I, I think we can buy into that. If that's what it says, I can believe that. So if they have come out of the great tribulation, it must mean that the tribulation is either over or near over. And it goes on to say why it's not over. So it tells us, but it does say that it's near over. They came out of the great tribulation. In other words, this group has came through the tribulation, the worst of the worst, and at some point now in the tribulation, before the second coming of the Lord, this is second coming because he comes to the earth. These are not on the earth. This isn't a part of him coming to the earth. This is a part of him taking them from the earth. So they've come to this point, and I'm going to draw the arrow right there, and then they are now found here, okay? Right? I'm going to make two points of departure because we're going to talk about two points of departure. But at the moment, we're talking about this, this time of departure. In the vision that John sees, it's the multitudes out of every tongue. Now, this is not a discernible bride here. This is not 144,000 that follow the Lord wherever they goeth. This is all of those dead and living that have been caught up in the heavenly places after the tribulation. So we could also then draw another circle down here, and we could put in here Hades, right? The intermediate place of the dead. So in the including in this one, 
we can say that a part of those multitudes, what makes up those multitudes, was those that were dead. And that they were called out, the faithful that were called out of Hades were first called up, and then those that were living on the earth, then they together were caught up into the heavens with the Lord. So, you're just saying amen, or you're going to say something, Jim? Say it, Jim. Amen. That's right. There's a joining. There's a joining in that that they're they're all called of God, but one are called of one vine, another are called of another vine, and we're going to talk about the three vines in the earth in a minute. So to get, but together in this second calling here of this second vision, I should say that we're reading about in the seventh chapter of uh, Revelation focuses on the end of the tribulation. It focuses on the whole group, and it gives us kind of the end before it fills in, backfills in Scripture's following. So then in the 14th verse, And I said to him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which come out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. Neither shall the sun light on them nor any heat. For the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto the living fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes. In that last few verses of the uh, seventh chapter, of Revelation, you can also correlate that with the last verses of Isaiah 63. First part of Isaiah 63, it's a pounding. Bam, bam, blood everywhere. In the second part of Isaiah 63, you have the same type of exhortation that you have in the last part of chapter 7. Not to try to lose you, but I want to put that on tape so somebody that's very interested can pause and think about what I just said and go read it. So I'm going to get it out there. I'm going to put it on tape anyway. So there we are in in talking about these other events or things that are adding, uh, that are pointing towards this day of vengeance when the Lord is covered with his blood. We've read this now in chapter 7. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 14, where is probably the most of our focus is going to be in this chapter because it's the most succinct and most chronological of all the chapters as it relates to these events, the timing of these events. So we pick up in the 14th chapter, in the 17th verse, and we'll backfill it in a minute, but reading the 17th verse, it says, And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, I was talking about three vines, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. There's one vine. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and the blood came out of the winepress even unto the horse bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. Now, if you can't find the parallel scripture in Genesis chapter 63, verses 1, 2, 3, 4, then I want to stop here and tell you do. Because that's the exact same description of the event that Isaiah is seeing by the Spirit. And he's looking forward all the way to the day of the Lord. So this scripture in the 14th chapter of Revelation, in these last verses, has to do with the same event of Isaiah 63. It has to do with the same event that Deuteronomy 32 is speaking about. It has to do with the same event of Revelation 19. 19, when the Lord rides on his white horse. That, this scripture, has to do with that same exact event. They're all chronologically the very same event. 
and it's compared to that uh, gleaning of the vintage. And it is the wine press of the wrath of God on the earth at the second coming of Christ. That's when that happens. That's when the blood flows for 160 miles deep. That's when it happens right then. That's the great wine press. Yes, there's a bloodletting all along the way, but this is the climax to the wrath of God. It's the re- uh, vengeance of God. It's the great day of the Lord. It's the second coming of Christ. And it's compared to here as that vintage. Then the 15th chapter, and I don't know how much scripture I'm going to read because you know what? You all get bored, and in a time we'll, it'll be dark. But, but we want to get enough that we begin to get the understanding of uh, there are verses in the book of Revelation that correlate to the same events, but they're spread about upon the whole book. And so we need to pick out the right verses that go with the right event in each, ver- each chapter, thereby getting the feel for the chronological order of what happens. So when you go to the 15th chapter, and I'm pointing us toward that event of 19th chapter of Revelation with the riding in of the horse on the Lord, I'm pointing you to the 15th chapter of Revelation to get another perspective of that same event that we read in the last part of Revelation chapter 7, starting with chapter, starting with verse 1 and chapter 15. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. These are the vials. These are the last seven judgments of God. They finish it up. These are poured out on the enemies of God, his adversaries and enemies. Verse 2, And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that gotten, had gotten the victory over the beast. All right. You remember what we read over there in the last chapter, chapter 7? Those were victorious that came through the tribulation victorious and received the white robes, right? So here it is, we're seeing that same exact time frame portrayed here in the 15th chapter. So it, ha- it has to do, it ha- wants to say there's something going on here. What is it? Well, before the seven vials are poured out, the last wrath judgments of God, we then can locate and recognize that that event of the harvest has already happened. Not the vintage uh, reaping, but the harvest prior to the vintage eating. You know, in relative, you always keep in chronological order exactly the way it is. You don't mix it up. It's first fruits, harvest, vintage. We read the scriptures that had to do with vintage in the, 15th cha- in the 14th chapter in the last few verses. Now we're backed up a notch here, and we're looking at the harvest, which happens before the vintage. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name and stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord our God Almighty. Just and true are thy works, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou art a all, only art holy, for all the nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. Oh, I, I just don't know how much detail. So here, we're talking about the, the tabernacle, right? Okay, the tabernacle, and in my mind, that's the Ezekiel's tribune, tribunal tabernacle where the throne has been set up, the altar is being set up, and these now these multitudes of people are saying, praise the Lord, hallelujah. They've been caught up in the harvest just before the vintage, and they're, 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 getting, uh, they're a part of, they're privileged to, seeing the opening of the tabernacle, seeing the opening of the, uh, of the, of the altar, seeing in there, being there, being involved with it, singing hallelujah. Judgment, the judgments of God are just and they're coming and uh, hallelujah, praise God. And they're glorifying God for what they now is about to happen, which is the reaping of the vintage, the day of the Lord. Up to this point, they haven't come. The Lord hasn't come to the earth, but they've been caught up, but they can see and they can hear the angels speaking and they can see God saying, release the vials. 
And that's what we see in the 15th chapter is that prelude between the fourth, end of the 14th chapter and the beginning of the vials in the 16th chapter. We see this hallelujah group, this whole, this multitude again that we have already seen in the 7th chapter. So it's there in the last, last of the 7th chapter. It's repeated here in the 15th chapter. It's the same people, same event, just before the vintage. But after the tribulation, after the majority of the tribulation, they've went through the tribulation. They didn't bow their knee. They didn't take the mark. And they were found faithful. They endured. So they're hallelujah. How, how, many, how much rejoicing would we do if we were there and not there? Hallelujah. We made it. Glory to God. Oh, but look at his, his fierce and just wrath that's being poured out. Oh, hallelujah. What a glorious God. Behold him in his goodness and his severeness. I'm sure that's all the part of the thinking there that's going on. So and then other verses in chapter 19, Revelation chapter 19, in the first verses leading up to that event of the actual second coming of the Lord, we have some very significant things happening in the first part of the 19th chapter. In the first part of the 19th chapter, we see for the third time, probably more, but that's what I know, 7th, 14th, 15th, and now the 19th. That's the fourth place that I remember that there, are, there is this gathering of the first fruits and the harvest prior to the vintage that is seen, and they're the same kinds of words and same kinds of happenings are described here since verse 1. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah! What event? The event was the destruction of Babylon. Now, where are the much people in heaven? Okay, this is prior to the day of the vengeance of the Lord, and it's after the destruction of Babylon. The destruction of the Babylon, my friends, if you, you know, scripturally and chronologically, is toward the very end of the tribulation. It's at the end of his powerful, successful, and overwhelming, victorious ruling of the earth. It's at the end because that's his established place. And the Lord destroys it while he's away, but he destroys it in the eyes and it's right in front of him. And so these, these that are in heaven were gathered up to heaven before this great judgment was poured out, which was the seventh vial. The seventh vial poured out is when it was that we see the destruction of Babylon. God came back into his memory. Well, the, those that God has taken out of here, they're rejoicing in heaven. They're not on the earth. They're gone. There's no salt and light on the earth. It's a polluted, fully wicked, unrepented, totally dark society. They are gathered against God. How dark could you be to be gathered against God? And these in heaven are seeing this last seventh veil. The Babylon comes caving down, is crushed down, and the earth opens up and it falls all the way to the pit. And hallelujah, praise God. Look at his judgments. Look at his just judgments. Praise God, we're not there, we're here. He has gloriously saved us. Praise his holy name. Jim. Yeah. Now, why are they happy? Yeah. Well, if you're asking the question, it's because mercy and grace is over, my friends, and judgment and justice is set in. The Lord is no longer at the right hand of the Father interceding for us on a daily basis. He is now taking his investiture as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He's now moving into the Melchizedek ministry of the kingly ministry. He's no longer in the priestly ministry. He is now. And justice and judgment is going to rule and it's filled up. The cup of God's judgment and justice is overflowing and he's going to fulfill his vengeance on the enemies and adversaries of God. There's no more prayers going up for these people. There's no more mercy. There's no more grace. It's justice and judgment. That's it. And you will rule with them in the, with a rod of iron all during this millennial period. If you sit on the throne with him, it's not about mercy and grace. This doesn't mean there isn't any mercy or grace. It just means it's about justice and holiness. The people are holy. God calls to holiness, and you don't toe the line, no rain. 
and whatever else comes with the consequences of not being holy and righteous. No spinning, no legal lawyers standing on every corner trying to hire and spin the law to their favor, your favor. It's justice and holiness ruled by God who sees into the very nuances of everything and every reign of your heart. He can rule and he will rule and he'll be without Satan in the way or interference and in our, we'll have a whole different perspective. That's why there is no prayers going up. That's why there's no mercy and grace in this period, in this moment of time. Sorry, I'm just a little excited today. I back up a little bit, take a little off, take a little edge off. But this is exciting. It's so real to me that I'm living it right here. I'm living this very moment. I'm seeing it flash before my eyes. I can just, I'm all, I can hardly speak because I see the glory of God. What a wonderful, uh, what a wonderful God we have. What a beautiful story. You couldn't make this stuff up. You know, the very best of them to try. Ron Hubbard has tried his very best to make up the spaciest things he can. He gets people falling out, whatever. But you can't make this stuff up. This, this is beyond a believable. It takes a spirit of faith in the Holy Spirit to convince. But one, once you get it, yeah, there's nothing to move you off of it. It is as real as you existing. So we're speaking in terms of what other example there is here in what chapter, kind of breaking these chapters down so we can make sense and order of them, chapter 19 is another uh, expose on that day of the Lord, the great day of vengeance, and what is happening. These have been sealed. They are there on the earth. Then these have been caught up into the heavens with Christ, and they're there saying, Hallelujah, glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God, for true and righteous are His judgments, for He hath judged the great whore. See, they're in heaven when Babylon is judged. Are you with me? But the tribulation is not over. It, they were yeah, there when he was when uh, Ahor was judged. You know, this, this is the answer to those that think we all are going through the tribulation. And this is the answer to those who think none are going to the tribulation. They, if you'll listen, you can find the truth in the Word of God, which is in the middle. Not all go through the tribulation. But not all get relieved of the tribulation. That's why no one can connect because they're so dogmatic about one or the other, they can't see the truth. The reality is, these are those that are in the heavens. But some of them went through the tribulation, didn't it say? Well, they were there because they went through the tribulation. This doesn't mean the tribulation is over, it just means they went through that that God had said, You're going to go through the tribulation until the sun gets so hot you are ripe. That's why they're going into the, through the tribulation. That's to the point. When God has judged the sun, has baked them dry, they no longer have any life in them that's stuck to the earth. Now I can reap them. I can take them out of there. That doesn't, there's yet the vials that have to be poured out on his adversaries and enemies, but the ripening power of the judgments of God have already served their purpose. No longer will he leave them there. It is not his wrath that they have been pointed out to. It's to his wondrous wisdom in that how that his wrath works their wondrous deliverance. Get it. Get a hold of it because it's the truth. So then we, we move there from 14th chapter and the 15th chapter. We've now talking about 19th chapter, how it's the same event. And we see that this, is, this group, this multitude without number are in the heavens and they're singing hallelujah. And I remember when we were singing hallelujah, 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 I was thinking about this verse. And again, they said, Hallelujah, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. That's Babylon. And the four and the twenty elders and the four, four beasts fell down and worshiped God that sat on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. See, they've given up their thrones. They've given up their crowns. They've given up their authority. Now you'll not find them any further. They're gone. The angels are no longer ruling and reigning over the earth under the direction of God. Neither the good angels or bad angels. Now it's men. Now it's the Son of God, Son of Man, and His appointed servants. So here they, ro they roll before the Lord their crowns. They give up into his story. They willingly fall before him. Your wisdom and judgments are good. The Lord Jesus and his servants deserve this. They do. Here it is. We acquiesce. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. 
And let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white for the fine linen is righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the lamb. And he saith unto me, these things are true sayings of God. What am I going to say here? What I'm going to say is basically, what is it called? When you go into the cupola, hoopa, hoopa, I can't say it with that Hebraic accent, but this also serves as a hoopa, you see? You see, this is the reason why they're caught up. It's under the marriage. See, there's a marriage that's happening here, and it's prior to his second coming, and it's prior to the, the, the seventh and last of, of the finishing up of the vials. It's an event that he is uh, including after the destruction of Babylon, but it is before the second coming of the Lord. In other words, it's after the release of the deceiving spirits in the 16th chapter and the 12th, 13th, 15th verse that sent out of the earth to deceive all of mankind. It's in that gathering that you'll find that that, that gathering in the heaven is the is a runs on a parallel line. Only this gathering is a gathering under a marriage. This is a gathering under the gleaning of the grapes of God's wrath. So it is there in the 19th chapter we've kind of placed again around. The idea was to, to focus on the second coming of Christ, which is the actual literal of him manifesting on the earth and, and treading out the wine press, the wrath of God in the day of end. That's what we're focused on. But there's these things that are surrounding it that are so obvious and so important that, that he spends all of this time giving these visions to John to relate it all. Well, God would have us understand these things and he would relate it to us if our hearts are looking to God, purify my heart. I'm tired of being attached to the world. I'd love to be released from this world in my heart. Help me. Okay, I'll help you. I'll reveal my word to you. That's the only thing I can do for you. I reveal my word to you. That's the only thing I can do for you. I reveal my word to you. That's the only thing I can do for you. I give my whole spirit to help you interpret it and show you the things to come. That's it. After that, it's your will. It's your choice. You want to do it? You do it. You, and I'll be here always clapping, pushing, prodding, helping. I'll do it. But you've got to make the choices. So, oh, Lord God, reveal unto us your word. So it is by the washing of the word and the Holy Spirit that we find these things to be true. And we apply them in our hearts. It's a special blessing there, Revelation chapter 1, of those that hear and, 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 and do the word of God. So, Revelation 7, 1, 8, as I said, answers to Isaiah 63, 7 through to 19. Just quickly, don't want to spend too much time there, but... It is Revelation 7, 1 through 8. That's those calling out of the 144,000. If you remember, 12,000 from each tribe. That relates to Isaiah 63, 7 through 19. Starting with, I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord hath bestowed on us and the great goodness toward the house of Israel, which he has bestowed. That is what his, in the final saying when you boil down Isaiah chapter 63 in those last verses, when you boil it down, it's just God has set aside an elect group of Israelites that he's going to take through the tribulation, ripen them and sanctify them and put them in a position to run and be an authority in his kingdom through the millennial reign on the earth. That's his, that's his promise to Abraham, his promise to Isaac, I praise Jake, promise to his self. And he fulfills it. And so we see that these verses in, in Isaiah chapter 63, 7 through 19 are, are answered or are, are have in view Revelation 7, 1 through 8. Hope you can get that. As it is, as it and the rest of Revelation 7, that, that I'll continue to read to you, wherein you know, when he was asked, who are these, this multitude and all that, he, he was asked, uh, who are this group? That the rest of that reverence says also does it answers to Deuteronomy thirty two forty three that Song of Solomon Deuteronomy thirty two forty three are y'all still with me Rejoice O you nations with his people 
for he will avenge the blood of his servants. See, they're rejoicing before he actually does it. And will render vengeance to his adversaries and will be merciful unto his land and unto his people. Do you see how that answers to that? The ceiling of the 144,000? Do you see how that answers to the promises of Abraham? Do you see how that answers to the prophetic word of the, all of his prophets and that he will save a people, he will bring them through it, he will establish them, he will reestablish in the preeminence of Israel. And the earth. All of those promises, it began out of the words of Moses. Out of his prophetic words, we can find all these happenings. So let's read Revelation 14 because that's where I said we were going to focus. I'll read it quickly. But we need to understand, it's a short chapter, and what you need to see in it is, the, is that the feasts are the predominant subject of the whole chapter, and the feast and the times and the events that go along with those feasts are in their chronological order, which is where they would always be. So in the 14th chapter, we're going to begin. We're going to see three things. We're going to see the first fruits offering. Then we're going to see the harvest offering. Well, first, after the first read, we're going to see a time frame where there's an angel that cries out, fear God, fear God. All you earth, don't take the seal, fear God. So there's a time frame between the first fruits and before the harvest. And then there's a short time frame between the harvest and vintage. And all three of those agricultural examples of the prophetic word of God are laid out before us in the 14th chapter. And if you look at it, each event and each thing that represents type and a shadow is exactly the way that it happens in the book of the fulfilling of it, the filling up and meaning in reality when it's manifest will be in the very exact same order as God has relayed it to us both in the old covenant and type and shadow and here in the future prophetic word using those signs that he used in the old covenant. And he starts out, and I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion and with him, and 144,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads. Who is this 144,000? It's not the 144,000 that were sealed on the earth, is it? How could it be, right? Those are on the earth. These are in heaven. These are another 144,000. It's not the harvest because it's in, it's in multitude, uh, innumerable amount. These are innumerable. These are the bride. These are the bride of the Lord. They are a specific part of the bride of the Lord, not necessarily the only part of the bride, but they are the called here in these verses, the first fruits offering. And verse two, and I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song, but the 144,000, which were redeemed from the earth, redeemed from the earth. Okay. And in the actual literal, it's redeemed out of the earth. And that's significant in my way of thinking. Redeemed from the earth and redeemed out of the earth are two different things. These are they which are not defiled with women. It doesn't mean that they weren't married and they were virgins. This means that they had not had the world as their, as their mate. They were, not, they were not mated with the world. They were, they were independent from the world. They had been severed from the world. They had been married unto the Lord. And they had remained married unto the Lord. So these are those that were not defiled with women, meaning the world, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. This means once they are there, they are never going to leave the side of the Lord. If you were in the first, uh, if you were in the first fruits offering, it is a part of the promise of the Lord, and you list them out in the first three chapters. All of those amenities that come with being overcoming, if you make it here to the first fruits offering of the Lord and you're living and you're raised up, you'll never leave his side again. Ever. Because you're his bride. Does the bride ever leave? The side of the bridegroom? No. These were redeemed from among men. Not all men. Not all the church. But among men. Being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. First fruits. And in their mouth was found no guile. For they were without fault before the throne of God. In the heavens above. So... When we speak in terms of the first fruits offering, which I've taught often about, that's, that's one of the, the scriptures that relates to us the first fruits. It's synonymous with the 12th chapter of Revelation in the, in the man child of the fifth verse. It's synonymous. The first fruits and the man child is the same thing, same event, overcomers, caught up into heaven, at, 
caught up into the first heaven. And the reason that I think into the first heaven, and I want to get off point, but the reason I think that this first fruits, this is the first fruits, first fruits offering. When they're caught up in heaven, I believe it's in the first heaven because it follows right after the first fruits offering that there's the casting down in the 12th chapter. Both first fruits offering is related in the 12th chapter in the first few verses. And then the casting down of Satan to the earth in the latter part of the 12th chapter. They are, uh, they, these are events that are correlated together. The catching up into the first fruits into the heavens, it recognized that Christ is, is now manifesting his kingship and he starts in taking his kingdom in the first heavens wherein the God of this world, the power and the prince of this air resides. But when the first fruits come up, there's no room for Satan. Because now the new authority is in town. That's why I don't think this first fruits carries all the way to the third heaven. I believe it only covers to this because it's from here that he's cast down. Aye, aye, just, but it doesn't matter. As I said, don't matter. Same dynamics, same things happen. I just think that adds credence to the fact that the, the Lord's investiture is in the first heavens, not in the third heaven. Yes. 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 Sorry. You're exactly right. Thank you for catching that. It was a good catch. So in my, in my heart and mind, it has to be here before. This is the first fruits. It's after the sealing of the 12,000. This is the first fruits catching up. This is Revelation 12. And this is then that coinciding event is the casting down of Satan. Okay, and then I won't get into greater detail, which I'm tempted to. Huh? That's right. The two, the two witnesses are killed at the three and a half year period because they, they're, they're, they, they witness for three and a half years. So if they witness for three and a half years and, and Satan by the Antichrist rules for three and a half years, there's our, there's our marking time marking point, the, the death of the two witnesses are exactly in the middle of the tribulation. It marks the three and a half years. It marks it for many reasons. One, how long the Lord served? Three and a half years. On and on and on. There's many reasons. But that's when it's marked. At the three and a half year period. So then you know these things proceeded and you know these things followed. You don't know exact times are falling. And some of the seals are happening at the same time. The trumpets and all that. There's overlays. There's uh, But in just for we can understand it. So we can get a hold of it. God has laid it out for us. So uh, in a way that we can understand. Did you have a thought? If we're here, I don't know. You know, it's pretty severe witness in that it's a transition between mercy and grace and going into judgment and justice. And these witnesses are pretty tough guys. They're not, they're not mamby-pamby. They're more of the old covenant nature. They're more of, be more succinct and specific, they're more of the noadic covenant, you know, blood for blood, eye for eye, tooth. tooth. There's more of a, it, they, they will bring the judgments and justice of God to the earth. And they're, they're on the earth. They're sent from the heavens or from the, in my mind, probably from a realm separate in Hades that they will come from, that may be in the second heaven. Wherever they come from, those two witnesses are sent. Just like the two, now you get me way off subject here, but that's okay. That's okay as long as we stay on point and we can hold on to our other thoughts. We understand then from the 11th chapter and the 13th chapter that both the Antichrist and the false prophet come from the pit. The pit is in Hades. So those two come from that, from there to the earth wherein these other two come from, a, from a, a, a point of where they have never died. This is the intermediate place of the dead. That's why I point here to the second heaven, wherever, whatever. There's the first heaven, the third heaven. I don't know what the second heaven, so maybe there are those two witnesses that never have passed. And you've heard me talk about it before, right? Enoch and Elijah. They neither one of them passed. They're the two witnesses that they have to die. It's appointed a man of the one that they must die. So then they are the witnesses, and they are the prophets of old, and they're bringing a strong uh, witness of justice and holiness. 
It's, they're not, they haven't fallen in step because that step is over with. Mercy and grace is over. They're not falling in. They didn't come in the witness of the mercy and the grace of Jesus Christ. They're coming in the warning of the day of the vengeance of the Lord. And they're coming in a prophetic way to Israel. And they preach unto Israel. And they, and they, they are fall in line with the prophetic words of the old covenant. And they call down fire from, from heaven. And all their enemies are struck dead. And it's a powerful witness. So if we're on the earth, I don't, I don't know how we'd miss that. We don't necessarily be on the earth. I'm saying we'd be gone. When the two witnesses are witnessing, we, I'm suggesting to you that there's a good chance. I agree. It, we could be here, but if we are here, we're going to be caught up. And there's no way that we'll not be able to recognize, if we're on the earth, what they represented. I mean, well, I don't know how... I don't know, understand how it is that it can be a time where I will come as a thief in the night. But th it is, that's the reality. The Lord said that, that unless you stay awake, unless you observe, and that goes for the first church, the first fruits offering. They've got to stay awake. They've got to be alert. I don't know how in this dynamic, with all the tribulation and the signs and the wonders, I don't know how you couldn't be awake. But you know what? Darkness is a funny, funny uh, enemy. Darkness will make you think you know when you don't know. And, and that's the, and how great our darkness is. We, we think it's light, right? Matthew chapter 6. If, our, if the light in us is darkness, how great is the darkness? If you think you have light, how great is that darkness? So I don't know how it is that we could possibly miss, if you take literal, which I do, those two witnesses that are upon the earth again who are witnessing of the justice of God coming and the, the day of the Lord coming, but, but it, is to, it, is that, it is these two witnesses that the Antichrist kills, showing who is God. Who is God? God God or, is, or am I God? You, he, you've, had this, you've been unsuccessful in taking authority over these two witnesses. I'll do it. And he does it. And he kills them. That's pretty easy to know what you're saying, yeah. 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 There, there, there's no question that at some, in, at, there's some overlap there that we'll certainly see some of that miraculous. What scale is it on? You know, what's, how, how, how worldwide is it? How, how narrow is it? You know, how well known is it? What, I don't know. And what is, what's the environment at that time? Is there an America? Is there any such thing as the United States of America? You know, given, given the fact that you look at the news every day, that you doesn't, there's no guarantee that there'll be a United States of America at that time. It's a, it's a totally different environment. What you can believe is the literal fulfillment of these words. What we can't see is that we reason according to the day's knowledge. Well, we look around and we understand this is all we can. But if we change the whole dynamic, then, then, becomes the, then it becomes a, a, the order of that day. It's very, it, it, you, you can understand it if you're in that day. But if you're in, it, in our day and you're looking forward, it's a little bit, I, I don't know how that can happen. It's okay, you know? Uh, there was, a lot of these prophetic words were, were said when there was no way that the whole world could see and on the earth all the things that are transpiring. But the word said that they would. All the men on the earth will see this. How could they? They couldn't. It would take weeks for all men to even know about it, much less see it. But those words were spoken, and when, in those that were literalists, those that took those scriptures literally, they just believed it. They didn't realize that there would be television, but they understood. Well, I don't know. Maybe they thought there would be a big sign in the heaven that wrote across the sky in Hebrew or maybe whatever they thought. It didn't matter. Whatever the reasoning was, they still believed the word of God. So when we say these events are going to happen as, as they're written here, we can't be reasoning these things according to the today's circumstances. So picking up wherever I was, I don't know. Do you remember? <laughs> oh, we were reading the 14th chapter of Revelation. And so go, moving forward from the first reading, we're talking about the 
we're going to move on, and I've got to pick it up. I can't talk any faster. But if picking it up there in uh, Revelation chapter 14, verse 7. Now we went on from the first fruits, offering unto the Lord, saying with loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of of waters. You see, the first fruits offering is caught up. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, of her fornication. Now we know that's not Babylon, right? We know this is the destruction of Rome. Babylon, Babylon is a reference both to mystic Babylon, the great whore, and the literal Babylon, the city. In the literal, the Babylon, the city is toward the end of the, of the set. It's during the seventh vial at the end of the tribulation that it is destroyed. So this, which is after the first fruits, but before the vials is that Babylon in the sense of Rome, in the Babylon in the sense of the great whore. It is Babylon in the sense of the Antichrist and the confederation came together for the destruction of the religious entity in the earth. Right? Isn't this how he rose to power? Isn't this a part of his rising to power? The killing of the two witnesses, and then also the destruction of this mystical, uh, Babylonish whore, religious ideas that are in the earth. He destroys it, which is clearly wrong. It's representative of Rome. I'm not saying that, that, I'm not saying it's popish. I'm just saying it's Rome. And it's Rome as it, as it relates to the, to the religious powers that the Antichrist and the false prophet and the ten nation leaders hate. And it's, it's uh, obstructive to their purposes to rule the old earth. And the two witnesses are obstructive, they kill them. The, the whore and all of those related with the religious viewpoints in that time, whether it be in my, my mind, whether it be Islam or whether it be Christianity or some Buddhist or some Hindus or whatever, the, the mystical mystery uh, Christianity in the sense of Christendom uh, uh, polluted, like Jewish, uh, the Jewish uh, beliefs in Yahweh are polluted. That's what I mean. That, all that pollution there, that religious mindset on the earth, it kind of controls, kind of puts people in the frames of mind. That they hate. And for them to rise, for the Antichrist to rise to his supreme power over all the world, he must destroy that nation, that person, that people, that entity that represents it. And so what we have here in the second, event after the first fruits, the second angel that's crying out in the, this, the, this warning uh, that Babylon, Babylon is destroyed, is not speaking of Babylon the city, but Babylon the mystic religious entity that the Ten Nation Confederation and the Antichrist have conspired together and destroyed. They've killed her. They've burned her up. They have, they have uh, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Put a period on it. Verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a, see, then we had the first angel, now we had the we had the second angel, now we had the third angel. The third angel followed them with a loud voice. If any man in worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of indignation. Who's left? Well, we can't go there. If we could, we'd go to the 12th chapter, the last few verses, and we'd read that the church remnant is here. The sleepy-headed Laodicean people are here. The Jewish people are here. Those two entities and parts of believers of, in God are here. And who is it that Satan is, is persecuting and chasing and running down and killing as fast as he can? That, that entity. And who is this angel? The angel is ministering a fear God mission. Why? Because mercy and grace has the image, the Christ-like attitudes of mercy and grace in that intercession, that transition in that time frame is over with, and we're moving to justice and holiness, so the angel is sent forth. Speak another word. Speak the word of fear God, and don't take that mark if you don't want to. 
suffer the consequences. So this angel is not crying out the gospel, good news of Jesus Christ, but the gospel of fear God. That's the third angel crying out. It's after the first fruits. It's after the Rome is being destroyed. It's after the Antichrist and the Ten Nation Confederation are taking, taking preeminence in the earth. Now we have an angel coming forth with a gospel that is heard on the earth by the Spirit. Fear God. Don't take the mo mo mark because here's what's going to happen. And in the 12th verse, we have that absolute pointing to that entity that's in the earth that's both Christian and Jewish in that it says patience. Here is patience of the saints. Well, the saints weren't on the earth. If all the saints were caught up in the first fruits or caught up in a rapture or caught up in anything out of here, there wouldn't be an exhortation to the saints in the earth who are subject to the Antichrist. Here's the word. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. During that main part of the three and a half year period, the main part of the Jacob's trouble, during this time frame right here, we have the great, this great angel crying out, Fear God. That's the time frame wherein this message, this gospel is being preached. It's after the first fruits. It's before the harvest. We have the first fruits, we have the harvest, but we have another gospel that's being ministered in chronological order according to the Word of God. And I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead which are dying the Lord from henceforth, yea, and says, Spirit, and they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. And they die in the Lord. That means they didn't take the mark and they are secured with a promise that they will be a participant in the first resurrection on the day of the Lord. That's the promise, and that's what it means. Blessed are you the dead that die in the Lord. Now, verse 14, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud, one set like the Son of God, Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle, no doubt it's Christ. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him, and said on the cloud, Christ, thrust in thy sickle and reap for the first time. Well, why would he have to have an angel to declare this? I'm saying that there's another, in my mind, another reason from the creed believing that the Lord is here in this tabernacle. <laughs> just, just FYI. So it is that now he's saying, I looked and behold and voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in, thrust in thy sickle, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. First fruits, gospel of fear God. Now the harvest. What is this harvest? This is 1 Corinthians 15. This is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. This is the dead in Christ. This is those that are living are faithful and endured and patient and are living and have made it to this point through Jacob's trouble toward the end of the millennial, in, toward the end of the, the tribulation and are now are a part of this harvest of the earth, this second catching up and the second bringing or the first bringing out from among the dead. And he that sat on the cloud, verse 16, thrust in the sickle on the earth and the earth was reaped. They're gone. Salt and light's gone. Then came another angel out of the temple. All this is in chronological order. The only chapter you can bet that is in chronological order. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. He also having a sharp sickle. Okay, what is this? This is what is happening right now. The harvest has happened. That, 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 that has happened. But also now we have another gathering, Right? That was the end gathering. This is the one that precedes tabernacles. This is the one that points toward the millennium. This is the one that points to the eighth day. That harvest has happened, but there's another gathering happening. What is that? Well, that's in the 16th chapter of Revelation, in where it is said in verse 13, And I saw three unclean like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, the unholy trinity. For they are the spirits of the devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather, to gather, to gather, to gather, to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So while the harvest has gone on and while the marriage is now taking place in the heavens with all of those from those that are first from, raised up from among the dead, from the living, from the first fruits and the harvest, now there's another gathering going on while the marriage is going on, but the gathering is the gathering of all the nations and the people, the adversaries and enemies of God by the three frog lying spirits let loose from the unholy trinity to go throughout the earth to deceive those men into believing that they can overcome God and gather at Armageddon. That's what's happening. So what am I pointing to? I'm pointing to Isaiah. 
Chapter 63, verses 1, 2, 3, 4. That's the same thing that, that's happened. There's a gathering into the heavens, but there's a gathering that the Lord is coming down, manifest that he's going to soak his clothes with blood. That gathering is going on by those frog spirits. I mean, this is a last ditch line effort for Satan to overcome God, Christ, and, 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 and Israel. We're going to destroy God's heritage on the earth. Therefore, we will prevent him from coming to the earth. That's the last, you know, last move. Last move. He's down. He's on the earth. He's mad. He's, he's already made alignment with a, the dead man. A raised, he raised up a dead man. Just like the son of God became the son of man. Now this son of God brings up his son of man. And they have, he's given up his throne. He's given up his authority to a man. Wow, that's his last ditch effort to circumvent the will and plan of God. And he sends out his lying spirits out of all of them to bring them to gather up for this Armageddon, Megiddo. This great battle on the great day of the Lord. That's what's happening. While the harvest marriage is going on on the earth, there's this gathering to also. And so it says in Revelation 14, 15, he thrust it in and he gleaned up the harvest. Now what comes after the harvest? Uh, the vintage. So here we have then that vintage that we read when we start this lesson. So Revelation 14, 17 through 20 finishes with the third agricultural reaping typing, the grape vineyard. I'm back on my notes in case you wondered. I have been off my notes for an hour. I'm back on my notes. I'm on the third paragraph where it says read Revelation 14, right? We just read it, okay? Okay. 14, 17 through 20, finishes with the third. I promise the last part will go faster. 14, 17 through 20, finishes with, what are you getting anything out of this? Well, that's what counts. 17 through, finish. Reaping type, the vineyard. So we have these things from Leviticus, and we'll, I'll make note of the scriptures for you. But that we know we're following it. This is Jewish, right? Written by a Jew, right? This is written by John. He has a vision that's laid out before him with a Hebraic Jewish mindset. And so he says, this, the previous two uh, uh, typings, the agriculture typings, were the first three to offering the harvest. This one is the last and is representative of the terrible wrath of God in describing its per participating consequences as that, like the vintage reaping of the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe in the bloodshed of humans, typed as the wine press of grapes. The vintage is the destruction of the followers of Antichrist as the first fruits and the harvest is the gathering of the servants of God. That which depicts the ripeness of both his friends and foes. Isaiah chapter 63, 1 through 6, along with a beautiful scripture in Joel 3, 13. We won't go there to read it, but it's the differentiating between God's two gatherings there. So then I write, there are three vines in the world. You had to go to another page? Good for Curtis. God bless you, Curtis. There are three vines in the world. The vine of Christ. And now we need to, well, most of you know this, some of these scriptures in any way. John 15. Are we familiar with that scripture? Yeah. yeah or all, and I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch is in me that believeth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. And if you can't find that, the understanding of the first you need to meditate on that, but the fact is the first fruits offering and the harvest offering are the vine of the Lord. That's the first vine in the earth. That's, that's him. That's it. That's what we're seeing there in type. Again, in agricultural type, the Lord speaks about it. So the other scripture, John 15 with Mark 4.29. Mark 4.29. We'll read that one real quick. I think that's an obscure uh, scripture that, that, that has significant meaning. Mark 4, 29, but when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle because the harvest is come. Does that sound familiar to something that just happened? When the harvest is ripe, he puts in a sickle. And that means both the harvest of the wheat and the harvest of the grape vintage. It's both of them. When they're ripe, 
It's time to put in the sickle. And that's exactly what we read in the 14th chapter. These are the words of Christ that are speaking about the end time. And this is the echoing, echoing exactly what is being said in the 14th chapter as it relates to the first vine. And then Matthew 13, 37 is the Genesis. Matthew 13, 37 says... And he answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed, the Son of Man. So the Son of Man, is, is that's the genesis of all this vine, right? He's sowing the Word. And it's the, because of the Word that the vine comes up. It's the Word, the Logos, God, Christ Himself. It's that that is now uh, manifesting in the world, and it's now not only begun, that seed has taken root, and it's brought forth, and it's come out into the sun, and it's bore its fruit. And now it's time to harvest it. And so Matthew 13, 37 is the Genesis. All this, the vine of Christ ripens unto... Hey, buddy, that's why, that's why you're the great uh, 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 editor. You know when I cussed uh, the other day, two weeks ago? It's still on there? I told you to edit that out, but I know you got overruled by the CEO, CFO. And I, I just got a little carried away there. It's a good thing that scripture's not today. I'd be saying it again. So, <laughs> testing, testing one, two, three. Okay, praise the Lord. You know, and to get to this kind of time frame and speak this much, probably ought to stop for. A minute just for everybody to gather the thoughts, could take a break, it'd probably be helpful. But you know, I just bore, you know, I don't know what I think. Um, I think maybe I might pass before I get the message out. So <laughs> praise the Lord. So what we're, we're doing is we're establishing uh, the, the Word of God as it relates to these three vines because we're talking about the harvest, the first fruits harvest. We're talking about the harvest of the main crop, and then we're talking about the vintage of the wine press. So those, those vines are representative of those, those three entities. The one we've suggested is the vine of Christ in that uh, we've brought in the scripture of uh, John chapter 15 as our associate or sister scripture of 14th chapter Revelation to proof up that that's exactly what is, is, is that meaning. Uh, what the Spirit of God is pointing toward and comparing Scripture to Scripture. Yes, Kathy?
On the YouTube? Well, praise the Lord. You know, we've been blessed by that. Uh, we've had some some good, beautiful comments, and so yeah, it inspires me to keep going. It's not about numbers to me, as you know. Not in, not in noses, nor is it in nickels. It don't matter to me. But it does matter that someone would be ministered to. But if there's just one person being ministered to out there, praise the Lord. I'm happy. And I hope they'll welcome me into their heavenly place with welcome me into their place. And the, with, along with the many other uh, ministers of, of the truth of the Word of God. So thanks, Kathy. I understand that. And a lot of this I blow over pretty quickly because I know us here in my notes. If you're on the YouTube or you can take these notes home with you, you can sit down and study them. I wish that you would because you, however much time that we're spending here talking about this is just a fraction of the time that it took to put it together. And so it, you can't glean in these couple of hours what, what took many hours to put together. And, and what, what I try to do is make the scriptural references, even though often they're, they're repeated, 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 but yet, you know, new people listen to different lessons, and if, if I leave out those references, then maybe they aren't as convinced in the Word of God that we took Scripture and compared it to Scripture. We didn't spin this stuff up. We don't have an agenda. And by we don't have an agenda. We're not trying to build a church. We've never taken an offering for any of us. We've taken an offering for, for, our, for friends and missionary purposes. But we, we, we go completely... Uh, uh, independent of it, not I'm not bragging. I'm just saying that I'm I, I've been God has provided for me. I've hadn't had to be supported by you, and so I have no ties to you financially. I don't care if you give me a dime. Matter of fact, you need some money, I'll give you some. So I I'm not of the mind to that that we're building something here for a kingdom on earth. That we're trying to to appeal to those that are hungry of heart that want to move on with God and move into the deeper things. Matter of fact, not even necessarily move into deeper things. Just move on. With God, get out of that rut, get out of that hole, get over there, do something, be alive, be have some living faith. Without it, God's not pleased. You got to do something. You can't just sit there and be a bump and expect God to be pleased. You got to you got to put some energy in it. So you got to ply your heart. You probably ply your life. I have no idea why I'm over here talking about this. We're supposed to be talking about the book, <laughs> Revelation. So here we are proofing up these three vines, and so we're talking about. This the the sustenance of of the vine of Christ is Him Himself, His logos, His word. His word is our sustenance by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's brought to energy. It brings energy, just like food brings energy to your uh, body. This is spirit energy. It's soul energy. It's what's working in us our salvation. And so that, it, it's, it's working in us. Even when we go to bed and get up, we don't know how it works, but it's working. This is first, you don't know, but God's working in your life. That's what I'm trying to say. If you're putting any word, thought, or any effort into God, He's putting it in you. And it's happening. It's working in you. Don't give up. Don't lose heart. Those things that are so bad, so terrible, are working out your salvation. Don't. Give up. Look them right in the face and say, I don't like you. I don't want you. But I welcome the, the God's intervention in my life. If he wasn't there, I'd just be good, going on just whistling through the graveyard like nothing was up. You know, I don't want, I want, to, I want something to jump up out and scare me out of that, that uh, silliness. So I, it, may, it may take this or it may take that. With me, it took a lot of stuff. You may be not as hard-hearted and hard-headed and stick-necked as I am. A lot of things, and it's still transpiring in my life. God's still trying to work out my salvation in me. He's willing if I'm willing. He wants to. Do I want to? Yes, sir, I do. Well, okay. Even if it hurts, yes, sir, because that's the only way it's going. You aren't going to pleasure me into the kingdom of God. He's not going to pour out great abundance on me and get me into the kingdom of God because I'm just going to get lazy and fat. David said, don't give me so much that I forget you or so little that I curse you. So I praise God for that. I praise God that I don't want mountains of gold, which is what I was aspiring to. May God help me out of that. I've still, still, I've still got more than a toe in that. God help me. So here it is. This vine is being ripened by the Word of God. Uh, that's what's going to cause us to ripen. Uh, this is first seeing the reward of ripe 
faithfulness in the first fruits gathering of the living only, and then later extended to those living who endured the burning heat of the tribulation under the beast. We just read about that. Didn't we? After the first fruits and before the harvest in the 14th chapter, in the crying out by the angel, fear God. They, these are those people that are on earth that are, will have to, they have to endure the burning heat of the tribulation under the beast. What is the burning tribulation under the beast? Well, it's just the sun. It's just the son of God. It's the son. I'm talking about S-U-N. It's the son of God. See, it, only, it took a little bit of the summer for the first fruits to ripen up. Uh, all they had to hear was, in the latter days, there'll be tribulation, uh, and uh, that was about enough. <laughs> you know, they, they, were, they were motivated. They, they took to heart the word, the logos of God. They didn't need the hot summer. The, the rest of the harvest, that needs the hot heat, high sun cooking down on it. And that's what this is, this period of time, this Jacob's trouble. This, this whole period of time, here is nothing more after the first fruits caught up. This is nothing more than the hot sun of summer for those that are on the earth. They're being ripened unto the harvest. So they're the ones that have endured under the tribulation of the beast. What is that? That's Matthew 13, 6. Matthew 13, 6. I'm right there. And when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. Is there, is there a great falling away in the last days? Okay, when that heat, it's going to do two things. It's going to ripen you or it's going to cause you to wither up. And there's the word of God on it right there, Matthew 6. Well, that's, that's fine to believe that, but it's not scripturally based. <laughs> there may be pockets of revivals, don't get me wrong, but the earth is not destined for any kind of kingdom revival. It's not going to happen. The word of God lays it out for us. It's, it's totally the opposite. It gets worse and worse. It doesn't get better and better. It exponentially gets wickeder and darker. Wickeder, is that a word? And darker as time goes on. So Matthew, Matthew 13, 6 and 21. If you read verse 21, Yet hath he not root in himself, but, endure, but dureth for a while, for when the tribulation or persecution arises, because of the word by and by he is offended. So that's, these are... These are the words of, these are the negative uh, responses to the word of the angel who said, endure to the end of, of, the, of Revelation chapter 14. Are you all with me? And then we have uh, Matthew 24, 24, down that light. We're look, talking about the seed. We're talking about the, the vine of the Lord. 24, 24, we have that word, for there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Guess who that is? Take it, take, take it to the fullest degree. Take it to the, to the fullest of its meaning, prophetic meaning. What Christ, what was he looking at when he said, beware, watch out, there'll be rise up false prophets, false teachers. Who was he talking about? He's talking about the Antichrist and the false prophet. Revelation chapter 11, verse 7, where it is that he that comes out of the pit is beware of the, the false antichrist and the false prophet, which is Revelation 13, 11. And then them both working at that deception out of their mouth in that I already equated to the frogs, or the Lord equated it to the frogs I read to you, out of the 16th chapter and the 13th verse of Revelation. That's what the Lord's speaking about here. When, what, do you think the Lord didn't know about this? He didn't have it in mind? This is what the Lord had in mind when he said this verse. He wasn't talking about me. Even if I was a false prophet, he wasn't in, in the fullest of the sense of what he was warning. He wasn't speaking about me, although he was, you know, or whoever it was that might be false. He'd watch out, look, make sure they're not false. He was speaking, he was in the, in the full sense of that word, he was looking to the Antichrist and the false prophet to fill up the meaning of this word right here. And it is that word that we should be thinking of uh, and correlating in the book of Revelation as it relates to the, to the vine of the Lord, the maturing of the vine of the Lord. Watch out. Okay. I don't need to carry that anymore. So then, 
the tribulation of the beast who are then at last also gathered up into the heavens just above the earth in the harvest, along with the faithful dead in the harvest. What did I just say? I, I'm just repeating that in the harvest, the first fruits, the first fruits were, you know, was just the living that, that have now realized the promise of the Lord that said, I'll keep you from the great day of temptation, Jacob's trouble. Now we're talking about the harvest and the harvest being a part of, the harvest being a part of the seed, the vine, the vine of the Lord. Well, the vine of the Lord reaches all the way down here into Hades. So in the, in this first resurrection out from among the dead, which is a part of the harvest of the living and the dead, this is the vine of the Lord as well as this is the vine of the Lord. And really there's not any difference. There's no significant difference between the first fruits and the harvest. Both of them are seed. They're both dead to the earth. They're both alike. They're both equate to the same thing. Not one's better than the other. It, the word doesn't try to paint that picture. Although there's, it's better for you. Is it better for you to ripen up by listening to the Logos and experiencing it in, only in, from, a, from a faith perspective? Or is it better for you to go through and get the heat of the tribulation? Yeah, which one? You know, I'm, I'm of a mind that, that uh, is not particularly any more merit. It's just, uh, it's just better. It's just better. I don't know that, but the word, but the word doesn't say, you know, to these or to these specifically, or we grant thee the part of the first fruit. It doesn't say that. And in and in the type, the first fruits di only differed in where it was taken. Okay, the first fruits was taken into the temple, right? The harvest was left in the field. There, there's uh, there's some maybe some significance there, but they were all of the same quality. The first fruits just having got there quicker. That's all I'm trying to say. So th what I'm trying to also say is the vine of the Lord, we're talking about three vines, the vine of the Lord reaches all the way down into Hades where we'll see that harvest will include the intermediate place of the dead. Whereas the vine of the earth, this is that vintage, right? Uh, the vine of the earth or the world now fully corrupted in the blasphemous sap of the Antichrist and the false prophet are fully ripened for the winepress of God's wrath upon the earth. That's we've, we've dwelled long enough on that vine. And the third vine is described for us in reading Isaiah 5. If you flip over real quick, won't read the whole chapter. Isaiah 5, now when I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem, men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me, God, and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought forth wild grapes. Are you with me on this third vine? So there's another vine in the earth, the third vine, described for us in Isaiah 5, 1 through 7, with the Lord's words of Luke 13, 35. Matthew, Mark, Luke 13. 35. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Desolate. There's the word. You see? It's desolate. It's in, in, in character, it has a lot of the respects of the world because the Lord left it. It's Ichabod. I mean, it, the Spirit of God has left it, and it's desolate. And, and only the Lord knows the difference between the vine of the world and the vine of the Jewish nation, the elect and promise of, uh, uh, to the forefathers uh, of, of God, the forefathers representing the nation of Israel. Are you with me on that? But here he says, Jesus said, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate, and verily I say unto you, you shall not see me until the time come when you say, Blessed is the cometh in the name of the Lord. When is this vine going to ripe? At the second coming of the Lord. That's that third vine. They'll receive the Lord and they'll become fruitful. They'll be harvested at the second coming of the Lord. I'm not going to dwell there because of time. But note this. The rejection of that vine 
brought about the vine of John 15. That's also Romans chapter 11, by the way. In the tribulation, its elect in the fulfillment of the promises to their forefathers are seen sealed from physical death in Revelation 7, 1 and 8. We wrote that, read that. And that sealing was unto what? It was unto sanctification. That is to say the tribulation is death to the carnal and the perfecting of life to the spiritual. Then while Jacob's great trouble is judgment on the ungodly, it is the ripening agent in the fitting for Christ's earthly millennial kingdom. And I differentiate there because, and we don't have time to talk about it, but I differentiate in time because this kingdom, the heavenly kingdom, goes into the millennial period and through the millennial period. This earthly kingdom of which we are now, the vine is ripened that we're just now speaking about, that vine ripening and harvesting, harvest has to do with the earthly kingdom of Jesus Christ. It encompasses both the heavenly and the earthly realm. This third vine that we're talking about is the answer to the promises of God to Abraham as well as a faithful Jew over all time. So they're, they're ripened. Many of these are ripened during the, the trouble, the great, uh, uh, Jacob's great trouble. And it served to be the judgment on God's enemies, but it served to be uh, it served to fit those that are, are meant for Christ's earthly millennial kingdom. And these surviving Jews will be established again and finally realize the promise of God to his people. That's the second part of 63. And along, Isaiah 63. And along with these are those realized in Isaiah 61 11. As usual, I try to bite off too much, right? 61 11 says, For as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness to praise to spring forth before all his nations. We'll read that in conjunction with Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, and you'll understand the meaning of Isaiah 61, 11. And you read uh, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, And the time shall Michael stand up, and the great prince will stand up for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered. What is that? That's great tribulation, right? It's Jacob's trouble. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall wake, some to the everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And that they that be wise shall shine at the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many righteous to the stars forever and ever. So what you can see in the 11th verse of the chapter 61, the bringing forth from the sea is the bringing up the first resurrection out, of the, the, out from among the dead, the, the righteous Jew to enjoy in the kingdom of God. Thou shalt no longer be termed like it was in Isaiah chapter 30, 62. Thou shalt no, no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate. You remember where the Lord condemned them and called them desolate? Now he said, no longer will you be termed desolate, but thou shalt be called Hesbah, Hes, Hefzabah, and thy land Beulah. My delight is in her and the land and the people that are now married. And it goes on to say, say as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride... What's that? That is, as Christ rejoices over his bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. See, there's a rejoicing of the bride that has to do with the bride of Christ. That's not Israel. That's not the Jews. That's the bride of Christ. That's out of that other vine. But out of, the, out of that other vine, that, that those, Zechariah chapter 14, those that have, at the second coming, see the Lord mourn. Mourn for him. Those that are then sanctified and those that are then reaped and harvested, they move into the millennial period. That's those that we speak about are establishing now in the land, the preeminence of Israel. This is Beulah. Right? This is the married. Married who? Married to God. Yahweh. Oh, I want to get off into the book of Ruth with you right now. But I won't because, you know, there was a, you know, there was a, there was the redeem, redeemer kinsman, right? Yeah. And, and he, the redeemer, uh, redeemer, uh, uh, what'd I say? Kinsman was able, redeemer kinsman, there was a closer redeemer cleanser, redeemer kinsman than who? Ruth, prospective husband. Okay, there was a closer 
a closer redeemer, kinsman redeemer. Who was that in type, shadow? It was God. It was God. But he didn't want to jeopardize his house. Oh, now I'm getting way off base. Now I'm taking you way over here, way out of train of thought. But I'm just saying that that is what, huh? Okay, great, brother. So what, what, you, what I'm saying is, is that is um, the, 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 the nearer kinsman redeemer has the, the marriage of, of the Jewish nation. And that's what is meant here in these verses. It's reestablished, right? He's, they're estranged from God. He's married unto them, but they're, they're estranged. But now they're married again unto God. So there's, he rejoices over his wife, over his marriage, as Christ rejoices over his bride. Okay. That excites me. So Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 17, is the same event in time as Revelation 15, 1 through 4. Are y'all getting tired of this? It's a lot, I know. I'm saying to you again, Revelation 7, 9 through 17, you remember us reading that. Okay, the sister scripture, or another sister scripture of that is Revelation 15, 1 through 4. But just another picture of it that adds to our view the last judgment vials. These are the tools of the wine press. The, the wine, the vials are nothing but the tools of the winepress of the wrath of God that are now to be poured out on his adversaries and enemies. These then shown are to be the result of Revelation 14, 14 through 16 and gives us the understanding of the reason of the great multitudes in the heavens and their rejoicing in the heavenly perspective of what is about to transpire now upon the earth. The vintage gathering in preparation of Isaiah 63, 1 through 5, which is described in Revelation 16, 13, 14, and 16, which has one view, which has the one view as the result and the purposes of Satan. In other words, there's two views to the gathering uh, uh, at Armageddon or at Megiddo. There's two views. One view is it's God gathering, right? The other view is it's the devil is gathering. From the Satan's perspective, he's gathering those people. From God's perspective, he's gathering those people. That there's, so there's from a different perspective, you, you see how the word in the same, uh, the same events can be from different perspectives. The, the, um, Revelation 16, 13, 14, 16 which has the one view as the result of the purposes of Satan. That's him sending out the spirits, the deceiving spirits, the frog-like things. And then from Zephaniah 3.8, which also clearly describes that same assembly from the view as the purpose of God. You can read it. You can compare it. So you'll see the two different viewpoints. It's the same gathering, same people, but who did it? Well, it was God. And Satan thought it was him, but it was actually God. Another terrible day uh, that is further seen is in this same day is Isaiah 33, 1 through 8. We will not go there. Revelation 14, 20 declares a river of blood, four feet deep, 160 miles will come from this destruction. What destruction? Isaiah chapter 63, right? Verses 1 through 4, 5. Revelation chapter 19. So up to the bridal up to the horse bridle. That's the way it's uh, laid, for, laid out for us in Revelation chapter 14. In that vintage ripening, it's laid up that the blood will run as bridle deep. And the 19th chapter is the actual manifestation. The term uses is up to the heavenly host horse bridles. In the 19th chapter, we have the Lord riding in on a horse, right? White horse. And then we have the saints that are with him in, on horses that are also accompanying him into this battle at Megiddo. It is a reference to those horses, not some horses of uh, some machinery of the arm, armed forces of some nation, but the horse 
of a heavenly horse, horse bridle. It's understood from Revelation 19, 14 that tread the winepress in the valley of Armageddon. And from Isaiah 63, 1 and Revelation 16, 16, it can be determined that the reference of the 160 miles is that distance between Basra and Megiddo. So, you know, and uh, Basra was, was the capital city, I don't know if it still is, of Edom. Edom is now down in Jordan. But that distance is, down, is from, from Armageddon all the way down to Basra. That this is the reference. If you, if you look, you'll find that, that that's about 160 miles down there. Okay. All scripture related to these days and the final events give different views or perspectives depending on which vine is being focused upon. Zechariah 14 describes the same event, but as the cleaving of the Mount of Olives as he stands there upon and breaking forth of the living waters. That's not in the 19th chapter. That's not in the 15th chapter. That's not in the 11th chapter. It's not the 14th chapter. It's all those things that are pointing toward the same event. Now, this is Matthew 24. But all of those are the perspectives of the same event, along with Zechariah 14. And here in Zechariah 14, we have not only the understanding of the nations being gathered and the blood running deep, all of those things, but we also have the adding of not only is that going to happen in at that, uh, at that great event of the day of the Lord, the vengeance of the Lord. But also, the Lord will touch down on Mount Olives and the mount itself will cleave left and right and the waters will flow out, right? So in Zechariah 14, we have that ripening of that particular vine and those particular, through those particular events, it is in Zechariah that we find that that vine, that third vine, that Jewish vine, ripens at the time that the Lord manifests himself upon the earth at the Mount Olives. And then those waters break forth as living waters that shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea and half of them toward the hinder sea. And the Lord shall, shall be king over all the earth and the land be turned as a plain from Geba to Ramon, south of Jerusalem, and it shall be lifted up and it will be inhabited and men shall dwell in it and there shall be no more utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. Zechariah goes on to say after these amazing events that accompany the vintage re reaping of the unrighteous, this same 14th chapter, the last verses of the reaping, the same 19th chapter of Revelation verses, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So there we have the chronological order in the 14th chapter of Revelation we, for the first fruits. We have the gospel of the fear of God. Then we have the harvest. Then we have the vintage. And then we have that that's added in Zechariah. We have the tabernacles, all of them in the chronological order after each of those things have expressed. Praise the Lord. It should well be considered by the students of the word of God, which I consider us, that the end time prophetic events set before us, particularly in Revelation 14, are set before us in harmony with the typing or shadowing of the Mosaic Covenant. I suggest that without the understanding of the Mosaic Covenant or understanding the Old Covenant, you can't determine the meanings of the New Covenant. You can't rightly determine them. And those shadowings and typings in particular of the feast are in their order, and they're strict and they're unalterable. You can't change one. You can't take Passover before you take this and that, and you can't move it around. You have to take them in their order, succinct order, because they tell the story. They tell the salvation story of man. They tell God's plan, his prophetic words are found in the, the order and the structure. They're unalterable. And they were unalterable in the book of Revelation chapter 14. They were succinctly in the correct order and they depicted the exact things that they were, they were ordered to depict. They were used as agricultural examples for real realities that are going to manifest themselves, just as Christ said these things would happen. So this very, I would take, say that anybody that doesn't take these things in strict confidence of their, in, their, in their study of the Word of God are going to miss the significance. They're going to miss the significance of the first fruits. What is the first fruits? Well, Exodus 23, 19, Exodus 34, 26, etc. Uh, uh, there, there, that's, what the, that's what the old covenant shadowing of the first fruits are. Where are they seen in, in if the reality? Where the, if, the, if it's shadowed there, where's the reality of it? Well, its reality of it is in Revelation 12, 5. That's in the catching up of the man-child. And in Revelation 14, 1 through 5, the catching up of the first fruits with Luke 
21, 36. Luke 21, 36 also is in harmony. You remember that. It's a warning of the Lord. Luke, let's read it. Luke 21, 36. Is that what I said? Luke 21, 36. I'll read it to you. Watch ye therefore, and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So the first fruits uh, uh, manifesting, uh, the type is found in, in Exodus and in, in other places, but the reality, the, sh the, re the real of it, it happens in Luke 21, 36 and Revelation 3.10. Revelation 3.10 is... Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them to dwell upon the earth. Proofing up the first fruits concept. What it is that the 14th chapter of Revelation tells us. If you can get in touch with the old covenant shadowing, you can understand the order, the chronological order of God's salvation plan as it relates to the first fruits, the harvest, the vintage. It tells the whole story of the book. So take the new covenant uh, type or the old covenant typings. And take the, the, the realities of, of Luke and Revelation and another place and take the significance out of the words in Revelation 14 where it says, out of the earth, that's the first fruits offering, those of the harvest, those of the harv offer, those of the harvest first ripened, those of the harvest are the first ripened, the first fruits. Therein perfectly shadows the first two of two gatherings, the second being the main harvest. The main harvest is 1 Thessalonians 4, 4, 16 and 7. That's the reality of the Old Covenant typing. It is 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52, and it's Titus 2, 13. And you take those in conjunction with Revelation 14, 14 through 16, 16 and 15, and 19, 1 through 9, which we've just went over, you will find the, the literal reality of the type and the shadow in the Old Covenant. And these are those of the ripened grains, right? They're grains. Grains are significant in their meaning and the using and typing because they're dead to the earth. And because they're dead to the earth, they're also caught up by the angels. Where the, who are the reapers, by the way? And what is the sickle? The sickle is the angel. Didn't, didn't the Lord say it was the angels that would reap? So, it's, so they're caught up. The first fruits offering is caught up uh, as well as the harvest uh, offering is caught up. The main harvest, the, these are caught up by, uh, by angels. They're gathered up into the heavenly storehouse, followed by the vintage reaping of the lush, luscious grapes. What does the luscious grapes stand for? They are the full, they are full of the life of the earth. They're gathered up on the earth by the angels, angels, capital A, little a, unto the winepress, ripe for the treading out under the holy feet of the Lord. The very same scene set before us in Isaiah 63, 1 through 6. Then the very purpose, that which brings Jesus Christ down to the earth. The wine press and the, and the vintage uh, reaping of the grapes is the purpose in which Christ comes to the earth, the second coming. He doesn't come to the earth, second coming, to catch away his people. All right? You're out of sync with the typing. Are you with me? The, the vintage. The grape wine press is the reason, it's the purpose for which Christ comes back in his second coming. That's, in my mind, that's significant to correctly discerning the word of God and the examples that have given us in the types and shadows before us. The very same scene, I'm sorry, I read that. All in all, these types and shadows and examples, 1 Corinthians 10, 6, are instrumental in determining the events, order, and timing of the judgments and their conclusion. That is, the exercising of this world of its wicked power and the establishing of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And of the greater significance set before us in our moment of decision, this hour of our decision, this valley of our decision, do we make the choices of becoming dead to this world in the fullness of the heavenly call? All right, the deadness of this world we can become dead like the, 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 the wheat seed, right? We become dead. And how do we do that? How do we become worthy to be caught up? How, well, we have to die to the world. We can't be luxurious like a grape full of all the things of the world. We've got to be dead to the world. That's the way we qualify. And the, what, where do we find this heavenly call? What do we, 
What are you talking about this call? Don't we all just die and go to heaven or go to hell? No, that's just an oversimplification and a twisted understanding of the Word of God. And, and, and the reality is that we're called to a heavenly calling. And, and I encourage you to read without a re- interruption and meditate on the Ephesians starting in the first chapter in the fourth verse and going through, just read that one verse and then go to Ephesians 4, 1 and read it completely through 6, 18. If for an understanding of what it is, this de-leavening, what is this worthiness? What is this ripening under the harvest? What is this becoming a qualified for the harvest or the fruits fruits offering? That's what it is. And that tells us what it is. And be a part of the worthy, worthies raised up into the future kingdom of Christ as his bride, having been cleansed. You remember that saying, right? Without spot or uh, blemish. Okay, that, that's cleansing uh, has to do with the Lord, right? You remember Christ, that he, that he has that he has redeemed us as, and that to sanctify us and cleanse us as uh, from any spot uh, or blemish. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 24 through 27, uh, with, with Philippians 2, 14 through 16. That's the cleansing of the bride of Christ. That, but that's only one side because we're, we're, we're both bride, kings, and priests, right? That's what we're called to. And then so... So that brideship, the Lord takes the examples of, of a well-known uh, ceremony and ritual of marriage. He takes an example for us being called into a brideship with him without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. That's, he uses that as an example. It's like Esther. If we had time, we could type and shadow Esther and lay it, lay it right over the top of Ephesians chapter 5, verse 24 to 26, and we could see perfectly, clearly what it was when the Lord justifyingly brought in the bride. But the bride doesn't mean a guarantee of being a queen. I mean, just being called to be a bride doesn't make you the bride. See, so Esther, she was called to be but she, she had to go through a whole process. She didn't just get redeemed off the street and then come in and sit down on the, on the throne with, with the king. You see what I'm saying? And that's what the, there's a removal. What she have to do? She had to spend a year, right? They'd get rid of every blemish, give her some milk baths, and get rid of all the blemishes and all the stuff. And then she was qualified. And that's what the Lord means by he's going to cleanse us. How? By the word, by the truth. Isn't that what John chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 says? It's about the word of God cleansing us by the Holy Spirit and the will goes of God. And that's preparing a bride. So, but that's in the, that's in shadow. That's a type the Lord has rep, represented before. But also there's the other part of that is priest. Well, the priest said that, what does it mean to be without spot or blemish with priest? That they may be joined in marriage, right? Uh, and together uh, we can approach the golden altar. So you couldn't approach the golden altar according to Leviticus 22, 19 through 25 or 21, 16 through 24. You just be, it was essential that you be of the house of Aaron, right? But being of the house of Aaron didn't guarantee you access into the priesthood because you couldn't have spot. Even you're a, Son of Aaron, you couldn't have spot or wrinkle or blemish and enter into the holy place, into the holy of holies, could you? See? See? So there's an example to us is that to be priest, to enter into that golden altar as the married, married unto the Lamb of God, to enter into this tabernacle and to be a part of the events of the judgments that are coming and to be a part of the ruling party that rules in the millennial or in the heavenly realm, you, you, to be uh, adjacent to and be involved in the altar, the golden altar, you have to be not only married, but you have to be without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. You can't approach unto the altar of God, the throne of God, without having or with having spot, wrinkle, or blemish. And this is also typed for us, as I said, in the book of Leviticus, chapter 22 and chapter 21, and then that's the shadowing, but the reality is in Revelation, found in Revelation chapter 8, verse 3, with Revelation 12, 5, and Revelation 19, 1 through 9. I was going to read all these, but I'm not going to. 
obvious, for the obvious reason. Or will we choose to remain? We qualify, is what I'm trying to say, ourselves. Or we will choose to remain in full of the, full of the life of juices of this blemished world. Which is set out as a very real possibility for born-again believers. And where do you say that that's set out for as a real possibility for born-again believers, Mike? Because all born-again believers are guaranteed to be the part of the bride, to be a part of the heavenly group, to rule and reign of Christ. Aren't they? No, they're not. That's my point. You have to be sanctified. You can be, you can be brought in off the street and be a part of the king's harem, but to rise up to be a, his bride, you've got to be sanctified. It's the same way. We've, we've been brought in, but that doesn't guarantee us to be a part of the bride or part of ruling, part of the authority of God's uh, chosen son, or uh, only begotten son, to rule and reign in the millennial period with on thrones, Revelation chapter 20, 4, 5, and 6, uh, those thrones. It, it doesn't guarantee it. What, well, what keeps us from it? What obstructs us? What's the obstacle to it? Well, there are about four or five really easily discernible places in the New Covenant that shows us that the reality of the possibility for born and been believers uh, to miss their uh, to miss their inheritance. First Corinthians, the entire chapter six. Don't just read one or two verses. Read the whole chapter. First Corinthians, Galatians, the whole entire chapter five. Ephesians, the entire chapter six. Hebrews, the entire chapter six and the entire chapter ten. Read those chapters and try to come out of them without having some chink in your armor that you are guaranteed to be a part of the bride of Christ. Any guarantee of you being a part of any part of the kingdom of Christ? Find find it. See if you don't have a uh, see if there's not a possibility for you being excluded because you're God. Even though you're saved, you still have spot and blemish. Your eternal life is not in jeopardy, but your inheritance is. And we're all talking about inheritance here. We're all ta we're talking about about the higher calling that God has put on man, not not the lower calling, not just merely born again, not just merely passing through and just have the fires of hell just right at your rear end. That's not what he's called you to. He's called you to ascend, to sit on the throne like Christ with him. And he's called for many born, he's called to get many firstborn sons. That's Hebrews chapter one. That's the whole, that's the purposes of God. It's not to just let you escape hell. That, that's not the purpose of God. It doesn't, that doesn't buy the favor of God. There's not much merit in being born again, people. Oh, we want to think that's very meritous. No, that's Christ's merit. Your works are what's meritous to you in Christ. The works that you, uh, you have set your heart to perform, to be obedient to the word, to the logos, to Christ, that's meritous. You just coming out of Egypt wasn't meritous. It was all by the strong right hand of God. But you going into the promised land... Have, you have to take up the sword. He required them to pick up the sword and go in there and kill all those ites. That's where we're at, my friends. You, you thinking you're resting on your laurels, thinking that you have gained and gathered and gleaned and you're part of the harvest, or whatever, the good, all the good things of God are yours. That's a lie. You're willfully entangled in the lusts and falsehoods, and suffer the, you'll suffer the great loss of our promised priestly and kingly inheritance. Revelation chapters 1, 6, 5, 9, and 10. Here's a quote to finish up. I'm done. Praise the Lord, somebody might say. This is by G.H. Lang. Christians do cease to watch, and they do fail in supplications. They do stumble. And they do not always keep the word of Christ's patience. And it is neither true exegesis nor sound morally to console such with the assurance that they are equally certain to attain the position and privileges now in question as are those who, by the due use of the grace of God, walk in his fear. And that's the reality of this message. Amen. Shut up. Praise the Lord. Brother, <laughs> thank you, Steve. You're always an encouragement. But let's have mercy on these poor souls 
or on these poor bottoms of these souls. There is a, there is a, as you probably know, there is a, there is a string that runs through that whole lesson that ties it together very uniformly. When you take out all the extra rhetoric, all the different stuff, if you sit down and meditate it out again, what is it, of course, in my view, in my heart, is not only to bring the reality, the truth of the Lord, but, but to do it in such a way that these things of the book of Revelation uh, that speak primarily of this period of time are, are brought out and they're made real and that we have some better understanding than some vague denominational spin of it's all you know, shadows and type emblems and, you know, this doesn't have any significance really and no one can understand it and all those lies. God didn't, di didn't promise a blessing to those that hear it and listen and do it to the, and then keep them from understanding. <laughs> that, that would be, that would not be like God. So the idea is to further familiarize ourselves. I know I've made this drawing. I've never made two drawings the same, but I've made this similar type drawing many times and the purpose is, is that we can, by repetitiveness and, and continual uh, comparing Scripture to Scripture, just and change our thinking and our understanding uh, to the Word of God as it relates to these things. Praise the Lord. So that was the objective. I encourage you to read the notes, look at the verses.